Welcome back to another entry of the Disneyverse, where we try to connect every Disney animated classic together using in-universe connections, easter eggs and theories both popular and my own. This is the first part of a two-parter where we try to connect the eight separate segments of Fantasia into the Disneyverse. In this part we will be discussing the first four segments of Fantasia, Toccata and Fugue in D minor, the Nutcracker Suite, the Sorceress Apprentice and Ray of Spring. To make things easier, we will be recapping and connecting each segment individually, starting with Toccata and Fugue in D minor. If you haven't seen Fantasia, now's your chance because I'm about to spoil the first half of it. It's available on Disney+. Plus. Are you ready? Then I'll begin. Toccata and Fugue in D minor. This segment begins with a live-action Deems Taylor introducing the orchestra conducted by Leopold Stokowski. The orchestra comes to life illuminated by flashes of colour. Their music creates abstract shapes and colours which evolve into scenes of rolling hills and clouds before bursting into a bright light and settling back down as the orchestra finishes the piece. When you think about it, there isn't much plot other than music creates pretty shapes, but it is a segment all the same. When and where is it set? As for where this segment is set, that's quite easy. It's California, specifically Walt Disney Studios in Burbank. The abstract shapes and patterns don't really exist anywhere outside of the orchestra's imagination, so it could be argued the whole scene is contained to one soundstage. The when isn't as easy to pinpoint as you'd think. Although the film was released in 1940, filming took place primarily between 1938 to 1940, so we could place it anywhere between then. To make life easier though, we will say the segment takes place around the time of the film's release, so in 1940. Now it's time for the fun job of connecting this segment into the wider Disneyverse. Firstly, we know this and segments in Fantasia tie together through the existence of the orchestra, but this raises some questions about the very fabric of the Disneyverse. Why is there a live action orchestra creating the music for these in-universe segments? Well, to answer that, we can discuss our first connection. From trumpet to maracas, saludos amigos. Toccata and Fugue in D minor connects directly to another hybrid film, Saludos Amigos, and in turn its sequel, The Three Caballeros. Because in Saludos Amigos, we also meet some Disney animators on an expedition to South America. We even see them creating characters with the use of their ink. Their ink is what the music can are to the Fantasia Orchestra, a manifestation of the link between our universe and the Disneyverse. Both art forms are a type of magic that links our worlds together. The Disneyverse can be accessed by us using sound and pictures. The orchestra and the animators are able to travel between the boundaries of our two universes. It doesn't make the Disneyverse any less real. It just shows us it's a, real, it's a very real place that can be accessed by the most talented of artists. Toccata and Fugue in D minor's connection to Ludos Amigos shows us the link between two very important parts of the Disney company and how our worlds link into the Disneyverse, the Nutcracker Suite. After a brief interlude from our friend Deems Taylor, a new segment begins. It's the Nutcracker Suite, which I will quickly recap for you now. A group of Fae are seen flitting about, adding dewdrops to flowers and waking them up ready for spring. A few even add dewdrops to a spiderweb, really glamming it up. Their fairy dust, or pixie dust if you prefer, rains down on some toadstools who start dancing away. How they manage to make toadstools into offensive caricatures, I'll never understand. We then see some flowers falling down on some water who also start dancing. They lead us to some unnecessarily seductive fish who, you guessed it, also start dancing. Then some thistles and more flowers start dancing energetically. They freeze before we return to the autumn, frost and winter fairies who go about their business changing the colours of the leaves as the seasons change from autumn to winter and the segment comes to a close. And that pretty much sums up the second segment. When and where is it set? As for when and where this segment is set, I'll be honest and say I have no idea. There's no real indication of a time and a place where it takes place, but the Nutcracker Ballet was first performed in Russia in the winter of 1892, so I feel like that's a good year to place it in. The segment takes place in Russia, which makes sense because of the Russian and Asian influenced dancing that occurs throughout. And it takes place over the course of the year 1892, from spring through to winter, which feels like it speeds past because fairies don't experience time in the same way as humans do. Now the connections. 
We can actually connect the segment to a few different films within the Disneyverse, but because we have other segments to cover, I'll only focus on one in this part and explore the other connections down the line. The connection I want to focus on in this part is the dance of the blue fairy, Pinocchio. Yep, yeah, that's right, it's Pinocchio. The Nutcracker Suite can be connected to Pinocchio in a couple of ways. Firstly, those seductive fish look almost identical to Cleo from Pinocchio, to the point I wouldn't be surprised if Geppetto found her in the same body of water. And secondly, it of course connects to Evangeline, aka the Blue Fairy. If we ignore the fact that the fairies in this segment are not wearing any clothes, it's easy to see a resemblance between the fairies of Fantasia and Evangeline. Their wings look the same, they carry wands around, and even their figures are similar, not to mention the fact that there are literal blue fairies. As for Evangeline's non-colourful skin colour, we've seen that she is capable of shape-shifting in her first appearance in The Flying Mouse. It's also why she has butterfly wings in that short, but not in Pinocchio, and how she can change her size. These fairies were how Evangeline started out before she was trained to be the next fairy godmother. Some fairies change seasons and some grant wishes, and even if you don't buy this, you can't tell me those fish are not near identical to Cleo the goldfish. They look far too similar to not be from the same world. With this connection, we have now smoothly connected Fantasia to Pinocchio, neatly tying it into our past couple of episodes and making Fantasia the eighth connection into the Disneyverse with the inclusion of Saludos Amigos and its sequel The Three Caballeros being our ninth and tenth connections. The Sorcerer's Apprentice After another splendid introduction from our pal Deems, we head into probably the most well-known segment of Fantasia and possibly the best-known Mickey Mouse segment, other than Steamboat Willie of course. Mr. Taylor already gave a synopsis before the segment began, but I'll do another recap as well, just so you're really caught up. Yen Sid is practicing his magic, creating beautiful butterflies whilst his apprentice Mickey Mouse is fetching water. After he pops off to bed, Mickey borrows his master's sorcerer hat and brings a mop to life in order to clean up on his behalf. He lounges around, drifts off to sleep himself, his astral form climbs a cliff and sends magic up to the stars, bending them to his will. He plays with the ocean and the clouds, bending them to his will too. Meanwhile, his sleeping physical form is commanding the mop to keep pouring water out into the workshop, flooding the place. He tries to stop it by chopping it up with an axe, but the splinters come alive and each turn into mops, making the situation 50 times worse. Yen Sid wakes up and cleans up Mickey's mess. Mickey gave, gives him back the hat and goes back to cleaning up himself after receiving a smack on the bottom of a mop. Back in our world, Mickey congratulates to Mickey congratulates Tukowski on his composition before running off again. And that was the summary of the plot of this segment. Now it's time to move on to the when and where it is set. Although we're not given an exact date, our old friend Deems Taylor states it's set almost 2000 years ago, which would place it anywhere after 59 BCE. We don't get an exact date in this segment, but in the 2010 live action remake, it states the events take place in the year 740 CE, which is what we will run with. This means it takes place 1,200 years prior to the live action parts of Fantasia, a bit short of 2000, but I think it still works. As for where it's set, the live action film states they take place in Britain, so we'll also go with this as well. The Sorcerer's Apprentice segment is set in Britain in the year 740 CE. Now it's time to move on to the connections. The Fairy Godfather, Wish. Yep, that's right, it's back to Wish again. It's true, this segment can connect to a couple other films as well, but we can explore them more in detail down the road. But for this entry, I wanted to talk about its connection to Wish. Firstly, because Wish is already a film we've connected and thus further cements Fantasia as part of the Disneyverse, but also because its connection to Wish has some major implications for the story of the Disneyverse as a whole. As we mentioned in recap, Mickey's astral form bends the stars to his will. I believe since he was wearing the sorcerer's hat, he was actually performing the magic we see him doing, so he really was shooting magic into the stars. Since this segment is set a good few centuries before Wish, I believe it was this act that gave the stars their ability to create wishes. Mickey is the entire reason Star from Wish exists. Star and others like it were created because of Mickey Mouse, as a result making him a crucial part in Arsha's journey into becoming a fairy godmother. But she wasn't the first person to receive this title, as we've mentioned before. I believe the very first grantor of wishes before Arsha, long before Evangeline, was Yen Sid. 
He was the first fairy godfather of sorts, right down to the blue cloak. He was the one who started the tradition of granting wishes, possibly as a result of Mickey imbuing the stars with more magic. Stars already were the foundation for everything in existence, we know this from Wish. Everything in the Disneyverse started out as a star, but it was Mickey who heightened their abilities and Yen Sid who shaped them into what they would later become, wishing stars. If we want to delve deeper into this, Mickey is the reason fairies have fairy dust, the reason stars can bring toadstools and flora to life. He is the centre of the magic of the Disneyverse, as he should be as the mascot of Disney. As you can imagine, this is something that will continue to come up in the future, so you have to keep yourself posted on this series to see how. But for now, since this entry is already a long one, we will move on to the final segment of this part, Rite of Spring. On to the final segment of this entry and the halfway point of Fantasia overall, Rite of Spring. You know the drill, it's time for a recap. Some chaos ensues with the orchestra as Deansy Boy tries to introduce the segment, but he composes himself and introduces the segment as an introduction to what scientists think happened in the first few billion years of Earth's existence. He says the first living things were single-celled organisms which evolved over time, swarming the oceans of marine creatures and some ambitious fish crawled on land, becoming the first amphibians before some creatures eventually became dinosaurs. We start this segment billions and billions of years ago in space before making our way to the Milky Way, passing nebulas and suns, before making our way to a desolate little planet teeming with volcanoes, fire and smoke. Lava floods the land before crashing into the sea, the waves take over the land, turning them into oceans. Within the ocean, life begins to form, becoming more complex as it creates the creatures deep within the depths of the ocean. Then jellyfish and fish, which grow legs and become lizards. Fast forward a few billion years and we have the ple- the plesiosaurs and the pterosaurs, and then of course, the dinosaurs. Then we were introduced to our main boy, the T-Rex, who terrorises the dinos, chasing them away before eventually butting heads with the tail of a feisty stegosaur, before sinking his teeth into him, winning the battle. The other dinosaurs mourn the loss of their friend, but he's the least of their worries, because fast forward and the world is a barren place, no greenery in sight, and only puddles of water. They migrate in the hopes of finding a better place, but most die on a journey, and centuries later they are nothing but skeletons and future museum exhibits. Mountains erupt around them, the sea reclaims the land yet again, and then our crescendo, a meteor introduces itself to the earth and it fades to black before the orchestra disbands for an intermission. When and where is it set? As for when and where, well, it tells us. It takes place on the first few billion years of Earth, spanning from its creation to the downfall of the dinosaurs. And that brings us on to our final connection of this entry. They're all gone. Almost. Dinosaur. What else could it be if not Dinosaur 2000? We see plenty of the dinosaurs that show up in the film in the segment. It's almost certainly guaranteed that the events of the film take place during the Great Migration we see in Rite of Spring. The dinosaurs in that segment didn't get lucky, but Aladar and his family did. They found a nice little bit of greenery to live out the rest of their lives in. I've always thought of the place the dinosaurs find as a sort of paradise, an allegory for heaven if you like, because as we see in Rite of Spring, all dinosaurs end up as museum exhibits in the end. It's a morbid end to this part, but as Deansy Boy says, it's science. We saw the creation of the Di- Disneyverse before our very eyes, and sadly part of the creation is the inhalation not inhalation, annihilation of our dino friends, but when you think about it, their sacrifice brought us into the forefront. They stomped so we could walk, they stomped so the characters of a Disneyverse could thrive, so thank you Aladar for being part of that story. And thank you for reaching the end of this entry. I will see you all next time for part 2 of exploring the ways Fantasia connects to the Disneyverse, but for now I wish you Borada, Prinhanda, Nazwaitha or Nozda wherever you are in the world. It's time to get up, get on that floor, everybody walk the dinosaur. Bye.